So there are some famous couples that any time one member of that couple is mentioned, his or her partner is always mentioned too. For instance, Romeo and Juliet, Mark Antony and Cleopatra, Bonnie and Clyde, Ben and... <laughs> Overreaching, perhaps? Uh, I thought I might could slide that one in there and see. And it worked. Some of you. Some of you. Well, these people are always mentioned together. They're like peanut butter and jelly. You can't have one without the other. Well, there's a couple in the New Testament that's the same way. Every time they're mentioned in the New Testament, five times they're mentioned, and every time they're mentioned together. You never find one without the other. And so last Sunday morning, we talked about Joseph and Mary, and then this Sunday morning, we talked a little bit about marriage, and I wanted to just kind of continue along that same line, thinking about another married couple in the New Testament, and that is Aquila and Priscilla. So what I want to do in our lesson tonight is just look at each of the five passages where we see Aquila and Priscilla, and let's just see what lessons we can learn from those verses where they're mentioned. This married couple was a wonderful couple in so many ways, and I hope to, to point out some things, highlight some things tonight that'll be helpful. So do you remember what we read together in Acts chapter 18 at the beginning of our study? Let's read those verses again. Let's remind ourselves of, of what we read at the beginning. And now that you know where we're going in this sermon, maybe you'll have a, a better grasp of, of these verses again, and you'll be able to, to look for some things in these verses. After these things, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working. For by trade, they were tent makers. So we learn some things about Aquila and Priscilla that are obvious from the text. We see that they're a married couple. We see that they are a Jewish couple. Aquila is specifically called a Jew. We assume Priscilla is one as well. Now what we don't know about them is, are they Christians at the time Paul meets them or not? Or were they converted after Paul met them? We really don't know about that. Perhaps Paul converted them. Perhaps they were Christians already. Either way, they are a very strong religious couple, either religious being in their Jewish faith or in their Christian faith. They live in the city of Corinth. They came to Corinth after they had been expelled from the city of Rome. Now, this expulsion from Rome is quite significant. There's a Roman historian by the name of Suetonius, and he mentioned this expulsion of the Jews from the city of Rome. And he said that it was due to, quote, Jewish disturbances made at the instigation of Crestus, C-H-R-E-S-T-U-S, -E Crestus. Who is this Crestus fellow? Well, Crestus is likely a corruption of the Latin or Roman name Christus. Christ, Jesus, the Christ. So apparently this expulsion of the Jews from Rome by Claudius had to do with some instigations among the Jews regarding Jesus Christ. There was a lot of hoopla being made over Jesus and Claudius just got sick of dealing with it. So he said, you Jewish people who are in an uproar about this Jesus fellow who was from among your own Jewish people, just get out of my city. I don't want you here anymore. And so Aquila and Priscilla, as well as Numerous other Jews are expelled from Rome and they flee to Corinth. They work as tent makers and Paul comes to the city of Corinth. He finds them and he begins working with them to support himself while he's preaching. But there's something else that I want us to see that's more important than all of this superficial stuff from here in Acts 18. Did you notice where Paul came to Corinth from in Acts 18 and verse 1? He left Athens and he came to Corinth. I want you to think about Paul's recent travels, beginning in Acts chapter 17, where he starts off in Thessalonica. 
He preaches in Thessalonica. He has considerable success. Lots of people respond favorably to his preaching, but there are some antagonistic Jews in Thessalonica who aren't happy with Paul. They're not happy with what he's preaching. So they begin persecuting these new converts in Thessalonica. And the persecution becomes so bad that Paul has to flee the city. He leaves Thessalonica. He moves on to Berea. Again, his preaching is received favorably. The Jewish people in Berea, they're searching the scriptures daily to see if the things that Paul was preaching are so. But you remember those Jews from Thessalonica who didn't like Paul very much? Well, see, Berea is not that far from Thessalonica. So they come down to Berea from Thessalonica and they continue their persecution in Berea and now Paul has to leave Berea and move on somewhere else. He moves on to the city of Athens. And you remember, he goes to Athens, he stands before those Greek philosophers, and he preaches there on Mars Hill, on the Areopagus, in front of all of those brilliant, educated philosophers, and they laugh him out of the city. There were a couple of people who responded favorably to his preaching, but by and large, the city of Athens mocked him, and Paul leaves Athens feeling dejected. He's been chased out of two cities because of physical persecution. Now he's leaving Athens because people are mocking him and they're not accepting his preaching. He comes to the city of Corinth and he's discouraged. Things haven't been going so well for him. In fact, later on, he's going to write the book of 1 Corinthians and in chapter 2 and verse 3 he will admit to them, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Why do you think he was among the Corinthians in weakness and fear and trembling? Well, I take it it's because of his recent travels and the experiences that he had in Acts 17. And so Paul comes to Corinth. He's discouraged. He's weak. He's fearful. And when he gets there, he meets Aquila and Priscilla, this strong religious couple who lift his spirits and they help him both in his physical work as a tent maker and in his spiritual work as a preacher of the gospel. You know, God has a way of putting people into our lives when we need them. There may be times in our lives when we're struggling, when we're suffering, when we're not when everything is not going the way that we would like for it to and God places into our lives Someone who maybe they've been a lifelong friend or maybe it's a new friend who's come into our lives and they help us through that difficult time. And those people are blessings from the Lord. And I think Paul looked at Aquila and Priscilla in that way. He needed this couple. He needed their support and their encouragement and I'm sure they likely needed his as well. Well, let's keep going on in Acts chapter 18, and we'll see the second time this couple is mentioned. Acts 18 to 28. Look at Acts 18, verse 18. Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila. This couple has become so useful to Paul, such an encouragement to Paul, that when he decides to leave and set sail for Antioch of Syria, he says, why don't you come with me? And so they join him. Now verse 19, they, Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla, came to Ephesus, and he left them there. Now he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked him to stay for a longer time, he did not consent. But taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills, he set sail from Ephesus. So he leaves Corinth. Aquila and Priscilla are with him. He's headed back for Syria, but on his way he stops in Ephesus. And he leaves Aquila and Priscilla there in Ephesus while he goes on to Antioch in Syria. Now, let's, let's stop and appreciate this. Aquila and Priscilla have been involuntarily uprooted from Rome, kicked out of their home in Rome. They go to Corinth, and then when Paul comes along, they voluntarily uproot from Corinth, and they relocate to Ephesus for the sake of the gospel. Now, while they're in Ephesus, there's this man named Apollos who comes along preaching. Chapter 18, verse 24. Now, a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the Scriptures. 
This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. Now Aquila and Priscilla are there in Ephesus, and Apollos comes along and he starts preaching. But he's only preaching the baptism of John. Of course, now at this point, there's a greater baptism, the baptism of Jesus that has come along. But Apollos doesn't know about that. So we continue reading in verse 26. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who believed through grace, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the Scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Now, Apollos had a number of positive qualities about him. He is, a, he is an exceptional preacher. He's got a number of abilities that are, are very commendable and very positive, but there was just one problem. His understanding of the Scripture was not complete. And so Aquila and Priscilla, working there in Ephesus, living there in Ephesus, they hear Apollos come and preach, and they recognize this man doesn't quite have the whole picture. He doesn't have the full story. And so they take him aside, and they explain the Scriptures to him more fully. Now, note the tactful approach of Aquila and Priscilla. You know, they, they don't stand up while he's preaching and start screaming, You're wrong! You don't know what you're talking about! Sit down! Be quiet! No, they... I mean, you can almost picture Aquila just walking up to him and putting his arm around him and say, Buddy, let, let's go sit down and talk a little bit. They take him aside. They explain these things. They don't boastfully flaunt their own knowledge. Well, you know, Paul worked with us and we know the Scriptures better than you do. You know, they don't do that. They don't publicly criticize or embarrass Apollos. They take him aside, they explain the scriptures more fully, and through their efforts, Apollos becomes even more effective in his preaching. Well, now we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians 16. Paul later comes back to Ephesus, as he said he was going to do. And while he's in Ephesus... He writes 1 Corinthians. We know that because of 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 8, where he says, I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost. So he's in the city of Ephesus. He writes to the Corinthians. And he says, I'm going to stay here in Ephesus until Pentecost comes. And then when Pentecost comes, I'm going to head back for that. But now he's in Ephesus and he writes to the Corinthians. Now look at chapter 16 and verse 19. The churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Prisca, or Priscilla, it's just an alternate rendering, same person, greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. So Paul is in Ephesus, writing to Corinth, and he says, Aquila and Priscilla, who are here in Ephesus with me, they send you greetings as well. So they're still in Ephesus, working with the saints there. Now notice that the church meets in their house. Now, there's been a lot of speculation about that. Well, what exactly does that mean? I, I suspect that it means that Aquila and Priscilla had some kind of financial uh, means that was considerable enough that they could host the church in their house. I don't know that they were just extremely wealthy, but they were wealthy enough to have a house large enough for the church to meet in. So the church meets in their home. Their home is open to God's people, and it is open and used for God's purposes. Now, can you say the same thing about your house? Is your house open to God's people? Is your house being used for spiritual activities with God's people? Bible studies, providing meals for people, hosting the visiting preacher, or the local preacher, I might add? Uh, we preachers will tell you, we preachers will tell you that some of our fondest memories are, are when our feet are under the, the dining room table of brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're able to, to spend time just talking with them and visiting with them. We don't care about the food. It's not about the food. It's about the company. It's about spending time and swapping stories and talking about people we know and sharing memories. 
those are the, the things that we preachers treasure and we value those things. So Aquila and Priscilla knew that their house was actually God's house. It didn't belong to them. They were simply stewards of what God had given them. Their house was His house. He blessed them with it. And they used it for His purposes. And so whatever we have, whether it's our house or our cars or our money or our clothes or whatever it is that we may have, those things belong to the Lord ultimately. And we need to use our material blessings in ways that honor Him. And we see Aquila and Priscilla doing that. All right, now let's turn to the book of Romans. Let's go to Romans chapter 16. Here's the fourth reference to this godly couple. Romans 16. Now jump ahead chronologically here, perhaps about a year. Paul writes Romans about a year after writing 1 Corinthians. And he writes it from the city of Corinth. Now in Romans 16, look at verse 3. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Also greet the church that is in their house. All right, follow me here. Paul is in Corinth writing to Rome. And he says, oh, say hi to Priscilla and Aquila. Guess what? They've moved again. They're like Alan and Mary Gale. They're moving all over the place. And Paul is writing to them and he is saying to them, say hello to these people, say hello to these people. And he does it in multiple locations. They've moved back to Rome. That ban that Claudius gave has been lifted. They've come back to their home in the city of Rome. And Paul, writing to the church there, says, Greet Aquila and Priscilla. Now let's note some things in the passage here. First of all, notice in verse 3 that Paul says they're fellow workers. They're fellow workers with Paul. We've seen that already. Their, their working relationship started back in Corinth and in Acts 18. But I want to make a slightly different application than what Paul was making here when he called them fellow workers. Paul, of course, is saying they're fellow workers with me. They've supported me in my work. But I want us to see that Aquila and Priscilla were fellow workers with one another husband to wife. They were working together. As I've said already, they're always mentioned together, never singularly. And I would that that would be true of all Christian couples. That when we thought of John, we had to think of Sheila. And when we thought of Fred, we had to think of Barbara. I'm just making up names. I would that all Christian couples were that way. That we're so close, and as we were talking this morning, that our love would be so evident and made so manifest that you couldn't think about one person without thinking about the other. Peter said that husbands and wives are fellow heirs of the grace of life. And Aquila and Priscilla show us that we also need to be fellow workers throughout this life. Husbands and wives need to work together in all aspects of life. Spiritually, emotionally, financially, as parents. Every aspect of our lives. Husbands and wives, we need to be on the same page. We need to be on the same team, supporting one another and giving one another our very best. And then he says in verse 4 that they risk their own necks for my life. Now what does Paul have in mind here? Well, I don't really know. Nobody does. Let me give you one possibility. Back in Acts chapter 19, there is a riot in the city of Ephesus. You remember there were some silversmiths who made idols in Ephesus, and they sold those idols, and they had quite a lucrative business that came from the selling of those idols. Well, Paul comes into town and he's preaching about the true God and people are ditching the idols and they're listening to Paul. And those silversmiths are saying, hey, this is cutting into our bottom line. This is not good. This is affecting us financially here. And we need to put a stop to the preaching of this Paul guy. We need to, to, to quiet him down. So they go around and they start stirring up the entire city into this uproar. And there's this riot that's going on in Ephesus. And all of those people there are now seeking harm for Paul. And it could be that Aquila and Priscilla risk their necks for his life because of that. Again, that's just speculation. 
But whatever it was that they did, they were willing to sacrifice their own lives for His. And Paul appreciated that. And again, finally, the church meets in their house. Once again, they're using their financial resources for God's purposes. Let's go to the fifth and the final passage where these are mentioned. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 19. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. He just says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila. Now, when Paul writes to Timothy, th this is Paul's last at least inspired letter that we have. We believe this is the last letter that Paul wrote. I don't know where Timothy is when he receives this letter. We know in 1 Timothy, he was in Ephesus. But it's likely that he's not in Ephesus here. Look at chapter 4 and verse 12 where Paul says to Timothy, but Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. Now, if Timothy's there in Ephesus, he would read that and he would say, yeah, I know you did. He's right here beside me. So, Timothy's probably not in Ephesus right now. I don't know where he is, but wherever Timothy is, Priscilla and Aquila are there with him. Because Paul says to Timothy, now you go say hello to them. Maybe Timothy's in Rome, or maybe they've moved again. I don't know. But the point that I want to make from this passage is this. Paul knows that his death is near. He knows that he is soon going to be killed. He is not going to survive this Roman imprisonment. He knows that. And so he writes this final letter to Timothy. And he mentions these two close friends. Who would you mention? in these kinds of circumstances. Do you have Christian friends that are, you, that are so close to you that as you are near your death, you would want to say goodbye to them, reach out to them one last time? We would be blessed to have such friendships in our lives among God's people. So Aquila and Priscilla, wonderful couple. So many good lessons that we learn from this married couple. They had a strong marriage. They worked together in their marriage. They put God first in their marriage. They made considerable sacrifices for the Lord's work. And they reaped great spiritual blessings from their work. And I think they are a great example to us all. I appreciate your attention. I know this lesson may have been a little bit hard to follow with some of the geography and the time and all of that. I hope I made that uh, clear as mud. And I hope it was somewhat helpful to you. But um, if you didn't follow me on all of the chronology, just follow me in this. Let's appreciate this godly couple for what they did and what they stood for. Paul certainly appreciated them, and we know that the Lord did too. So thank you for listening tonight. If there's someone here tonight who needs to obey the gospel or needs to come back to the Lord, we're ready to assist you. We want to help you in whatever spiritual way we can. So if we can help you tonight, would you please come as we sing together? Jesus, the loving child.